Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Krista Sipp and I am a senior programs manager with Can Do MS. I'll be your moderator this evening. Tonight we're going to focus on traveling and recreating safely. Thank you for being with us on this webinar Wednesday and let's go ahead and get started. Um, first, I did want to take a look at June programs. So every month our programs build on one another to help you keep the momentum to develop skills and habits. Um, this month we're going to continue to focus on staying active. Uh, the upcoming Jumpstart and coaching programs both offer you a great opportunity to connect with healthcare professionals, um, experts, and your peers. The last session of the month, you'll see that June 22nd session is dedicated to your questions answered on staying active. We can address any lingering um, unanswered questions that you have during that interactive session. So please make sure to join us. Uh, you can visit our website, cando-ms.org to sign up. And we will save about 20 minutes at the end of this webinar for questions and answers. Um, if you have a question during the presentation, you can type it in using the question chat box found in your control panel. This presentation is being recorded and will be archived on the Can Do MS website tomorrow evening. You can download a copy of tonight's presentation slides as well as additional resources from your control panel. And with that, I'd like to hand the microphone over to our speakers to introduce themselves. Thank you both to Stephanie and Megan for being here tonight. Thank you, Krista. So my name is Stephanie. I am an occupational therapist. I just live right outside of Denver, Colorado. Um, I have been with Can Do for maybe five or six years now. Um, and I am really, really excited about this topic. This is actually probably my number one most favorite topic to talk about. Um, Leisure and recreation is just huge and really important in life. So I'm really excited to talk about it with you guys today. So welcome and thanks for joining us. All right. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Stephanie is very excited about this topic and it shows. <laughs> so I'm really excited for all of her um, creativity that we will give to you guys tonight with how to um, travel and recreate safely. And I think we we are all just really excited to get going and get moving out, um, out with each other. So I'm looking forward to a great talk tonight. My name is Megan Weigel. I'm a nurse practitioner in Jacksonville, Florida, and my focus uh, within MS care is integrative medicine. So let's, let's do it. <laughs> so our learning objectives tonight are to provide you with updates on travel guidelines um, and also recommendations with uh, how to behave, let's say, but keep in mind that these are always changing. Um, so on a weekly basis, uh, if you're tuning into this webinar, not on June 2nd, um, and it's three weeks or a month later that the recommendations may have changed. So it's important to keep up to date with the CDC. Um, we're also gonna provide you with some great resources for accessible travel and recreation, um, how it can be just so beneficial for both your emotional and your physical health to travel and, and recreate, um, you know, participate in activities that make you happy, um, and that bring you joy and, and the effects that that can have um, on your overall health. And then do this within the um, understanding that we're still in a pandemic, you know, things are starting to open up, but there are still things that we need to do to keep each other safe. So part of the reason I love talking about travel and recreation is because it is so powerful. I think, um, Sometimes it gets put on the back burner because we have to deal with things in life that can be stressful and exhausting and just have to be done. Um, and, and sometimes it's forgotten how powerful and how important it is to fill that tank, that tank of fun and enjoyment and leisure and recreation. And um, it can really make a big difference in your emotional well-being. Um, if we aren't engaged in things we love, we might start seeing signs of depression or anxiety. Um, it can help with that stress management by doing something you enjoy to help reduce the level of stress and kind of allow your brain to turn off that static a little bit. Um, it's great for also building relationships. A lot of recreational things you do are a great way to 
build some connection, whether that's with a significant other or a friend or just a sibling or a, a child, whoever it might be. Also, a lot of our recreational activities that I'll share with you today, um, some of the pictures we'll see and activities are actually great for physical health and exercise. And sometimes that word exercise can be a little daunting, I think, and people tend to shy away. So if it becomes something fun and enjoyable, that physical wellness, that physical health can be a little easier to achieve. Um, and just general socialization, getting out and engaging with others. And I know that's a little bit different these days and it might not be as pretty as it used to be, um, but we'll talk about some ways that you can try and do that safely as well. So um, one of the things that I just wanna to touch on quickly as it relates to emotional health and recreation is that what I've recognized in my practice and actually in my own personal life is that many folks are having a harder time with re-entry than they were with the shutting down of the world uh, because a lot has happened in the past year and it's it's made many people question even who their friends might be right and who you feel comfortable being around um, so first i would just like to say we are still in a pandemic and you still need to give yourself some grace um, about how you're going to approach, um, well, let's just say there are two types of people. There are cautious people, and there are people that are like, yay, the world is open, let's do a million things. Are you available for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and all the things in between? Um, so we are still in a pandemic. Um, we are in, uh, as I, I read in an, in an article yesterday, we are not safe, but we're safer. So we're in a safer place. So these are the things that we know. Travel is safer when you're doing it in smaller groups, when you're doing it outside, and when you're fully vaccinated. And for those of you who are just approaching the vaccine question, you are fully vaccinated two weeks after your last dose of the vaccine. So if this is the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine, then it's two weeks after the second dose. If it's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, then it's just one dose and it's two weeks after that. Um, masks are still required on public transportation, including airlines, and that's a mask that covers your mouth and your nose. Masking is still recommended in public, um, as is social distancing and good hand hygiene. And especially if a person is not vaccinated, um, then it is uh, more of a guideline than a recommendation. And mask mandates do differ among cities, counties, states, and then countries. So it's important that wherever you are and wherever you're going, you're aware of what the mask mandates are. And just know that the overall recommendation is to continue with these measures that we know protect ourselves, like masking, good hand hygiene, and social distancing. Um, this graphic comes directly from the CDC as of yesterday, which is June 1st. Um, I thought it would be helpful to see the graphic because it's one that you may also see change over the next uh, few months, probably not that much because of what we know about the importance of being vaccinated. But if you're traveling domestically and you're fully vaccinated, then you need just self-monitor for symptoms and wear a mask and take other safe precautions when you're traveling. If you're not fully vaccinated, it's recommended that you get tested for COVID-19 one to three days before travel, three to five days after travel, and self-quarantine for seven days. Or if you don't get test, if you don't get tested, then self-quarantine for 10 days, that you self-monitor for symptoms and that you wear a mask and take other precautions during uh, travel. And what does this look like? So I'll give you an example. Um, my patient coordinator in my office recently traveled on a mission trip to Honduras. She tested three days after she traveled. Um, so she tested actually yesterday negative. Um, and because she was negative, she's still required to self-quarantine for four more days. And she'll continue to wear a mask for three days after that, um, in addition to wearing a mask because she's not vaccinated. So. I am vaccinated in my office, she's not. So when she comes back into the office, she'll continue to wear a mask, um, but only quarantining for 10 days. So I hope that kind of made sense. She took all of these precautions um, following her trip. Um, 
Very important, especially if you're traveling internationally. Uh, it's it's really important to check the country's travel requirements that you're going to. So countries have requirements to get there, and then the United States has requirements for re-entry. So it's really important that no matter where you're going, you make sure that you're checking that country's website um, and then our country's website for re-entry. And now we get to talk about the fun stuff. <laughs> the fun stuff. Um, I know COVID is very important to talk about, but I'm sure all of us are just pretty full of COVID these days and ready to move on to the fun stuff. So let's chat about that. All right, Megan. So leisure is in reach. And actually, many of you may have already accessed um, some of these um, these opportunities because many of these places have been open uh, just with um, uh, minimal visitation requirements, so to speak, or, or lesser admissions. But museums and aquariums and zoos are places that have really been getting the hang of how to handle the pandemic. Um, it's important that you call ahead to ask about physical accessibility. You want to make sure that even though they may have been closed for a while, when they open up, they are open for of all levels of ability. Um, many museums and aquariums and zoos provide wheelchairs to borrow. So if you think, and Stephanie's gonna talk more about this, but gosh, if you think that it would conserve some energy for you to perhaps use a wheelchair through a large venue like this, um, then you may be able to just borrow one from the venue itself. Um, and then if you have visual limitations, it's important to bring magnifying lenses or binoculars. Now. You might say, well, this is weird. I don't really think that I need this stuff. And um, this kind of makes me feel like I have more of a problem than I actually do. But the whole point of what we're, the things that we're telling you to, or we're suggesting you do, are to make leisure more fun, to give you more energy to do more leisurely things during the day, um, and to make them more enjoyable. So these are just really practical hints. If you're thinking about a concert or a sporting event, um, there are actually passes and special seating available for people that have accessibility issues. And let me tell you that often that seating is the best seat in the house, quite literally speaking. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so ask about it, um, ask about it. Inquire about early access and special entrance um, or lines to concerts and sporting events. Request locations for your seats near restrooms if possible, because again, it conserves energy, it saves time for you. Um, and you can also look up um, American with Disabilities Act reviews for venues at the website uh, that's listed here. Again, when the slide goes away, you'll have access to it later this evening. Um, and then also on the CDC website, um, you can look up information about how to safely attend um, sporting events during COVID-19. So there's so just so much available to do and to do safely um, and to do in a way that supports you in the best way possible. You know, it was really interesting. I went to a um, Colorado Rockies game, a baseball game one time, right after I had had surgery on my ankle and I was in the wheelchair and it was really a nightmare trying to get through the crazy lines. And someone came over and they were like, hey, you know, we have a wheelchair accessible line and they brought me over and there was no line. They brought me right in. So little things like that, that just make it easier on you. Um, just keep it in mind and, you know, accepting that help or accepting that that flexibility of that can actually really make your day just so much better. So I thought it was really uh, interesting when I had that happen. Absolutely. <laughs> it was a very different perspective, right? <laughs> like, cause I haven't had that experience myself until I was, you know, in a wheelchair with my leg propped up and hitting everybody in the back of the knees. <laughs> yeah, and using your own advice and it worked, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So here I have tons of pictures and I put a lot of pictures in here because I want you to be as excited as I am and as Megan is because there's just so many ways to adapt and modify things and it's it's all about being creative, right? So thinking outside of the box and accepting some different ways to do things can really open up 
Pandora's box, right? It, it's opening that world of things that you might not have realized you're able to access. Um, so, and it doesn't mean you have to be in a wheelchair to need these accessible things. These things are good for anybody that is conserving energy, might not have the balance while sitting, might not have hand control as well as you would like it to be. Um, so different adaptations can be made for all different kinds of needs. Um, so here you can see we have adaptive equipment for beaches, pools, and lakes. So these are kind of more water activities we're showing here. Um, you can see the, the couple in the kayak paddling. Um, and it's hard to tell in this picture, but there's actually a little support in the middle of that kayak paddle that's holding the paddle up. So instead, he's just kind of maneuvering it side to side, not lifting it. So it takes a lot of the weight off. It reduces the need for the upper body strength, but allows you to kind of use more of your trunk and range of motion to move that paddle. Um, another thing is in that picture, a tandem kayak alone can be a help because then that person that's with you can be providing a little bit of the effort to help you move as well. The next picture beside it, we have a beach wheelchair. Um, and actually a lot of beaches offer these to borrow, which was really cool. And Megan is out by the beach. So, you know, a Florida girl with that beautiful tan she has right now. <laughs> I'm sure you see these all the time. I'm in Colorado, so I don't see these all the time, but I did live in Virginia before. Um, and Virginia Beach had these available to borrow. Um, so reaching out to um, the city and asking how you can access them or at the beach. And Megan, how do you usually get well, home? Might I add that if you're visiting um, a coastal location, a lot of hotels have these. Oh, nice. Yeah, and, and you're going to mention uh, boardwalks in a second, but also uh, a lot of hotels will have, um, it's almost like a carpet, like a grooved carpet that goes out onto the beach, so yep. it's e easier to take down your equipment. Yep. Yeah, um, either the carpet or some of them will even make the boardwalk that actually goes all the way out almost to yep. the water. Yep. Um, and those are really nice. And actually the, the beach in Virginia Beach, we have a fully accessible playground on the beach too, which was really <laughs> exciting. Yeah, it was really awesome. Um, so, you know, kind of looking around, seeing what's available in your area, maybe reaching out to those hotels, reaching out to the city about the beach. Um, accessibility, finding out you know, where is there a boardwalk to reach the water? Is it on, you know, 1st Street or 27th Street? Because if you park on 1st Street, you're not going to make it to 27th Street to go down that boardwalk without being exhausted. Um, so just some really cool information to know. And these are optional for buying as well. If you want to purchase one, uh, they're not super cheap. I did come across one at a store one time that was like $200, which was incredible. Um, yeah. But again, you know, another option. The next picture over, we have um, a lift for a pool. So helping to get in and out of a pool, you can see the, the girl in red is, is um, managing the controls for the lift. Um, and then the gentleman is able to sit in it and it can it lifts him up out of a chair or um, a scooter and then it rotates and then allows him to go in. And, um, you know, water aerobics is a nice exercise. So some people will use um, community pools and they have these accessible at many, most community pools I feel like have these. Um, and it might be a great way to get into some water aerobics with the community and meet new people and have social interactions too. Um, the next one over, it's a little hard to see, but that's actually a surfboard that has um, piping on the sides and it's uh, it was from a event that uh when i lived in virginia beach i would volunteer every year with this it's so fun it's called life rolls on yes. um, and oh you guys have it down there too i know it's so awesome and um so life rolls on and you can just google it and and i don't work for them or anything like that but it's a free program where they take people with different abilities surfing um, and serving might look different for each person. This girl, her surfing was laying down and those um, bars were applied to the side so she could hold on with her hands. I believe there's also one in the front on that one. Um, some of the surfboards have a little assist underneath that helps them drive out deep into the ocean. Um, and there's usually somebody behind if you feel comfortable with uh, having someone with you. You can be alone if you'd like as well. Um, but somebody can surf with you and help you go surfing. And it is one of the most powerful, exciting, fun events ever. Um, so highly recommend it if you're open to being in the water and tumbling around in some waves. But there's tons of people around to help you. So a fun activity. Um, and then we just had some more kayaking on the, the bottom there just to kind of give you another angle of seeing what a tandem kayak looks like there. 
right, so more fun stuff to do. Um, so I kind of made a section here about sports. So different sports out there. Um, there's uh, sled hockey, you can see on the top left. Um, so it's actually hockey seated. So they're holding short hockey sticks. They're only maybe three feet long. Um, and you actually propel yourself with the sticks so that you can push in the ice and move around. Um, again, there's a sled hockey team in Virgin Beach. Um, that's kind of how I heard about it. And then the golf, you can see right next to it, that um, cart actually is assisting the gentleman to stand up. Um, you can kind of see the seat has come up and he's leaning his bottom against it to rest while he golfs from there. Um, so there's adapted uh, golf carts out there, another option and kind of supporting and balancing. And then there's sitting volleyball. And uh, I actually, um, was in Hampton, Virginia, they have a sit volleyball group and there's actually a whole adapted uh, sports activity center there. And I have played sit volleyball with the team and with a bunch of the people. And it's actually really, really fun. It's hard to uh, kind of gather the idea of sitting while you play volleyball, um, but it gets really intense sometimes. It's really fun. And then there's also times when it's just kind of be fun and laid back. <laughs> Excuse me. And then the next one over is one of our favorites. That's Jimmy Huga. Um, if you don't know Jimmy Huga, he is basically the reason Can Do exists. Um, Jimmy had MS. He was an Olympic medalist uh, skier and he had MS. And when they told him to go sit in a dark, quiet room and, you know, just save any penny you could, every energy you can, he decided to say no thank you and he got up and got active again. So this is a picture of Jimmy skiing in um, a sled ski and you know just another way to modify and enjoy engaging in things again and there's someone behind him holding ropes to help control it a little bit too. Um, and those are available at most ski resorts and a lot of ski resorts, at least near me, um, have adapted programs. So you can go call ahead to ski resorts and ask for what adapted programs they have for skiing. Um, and they can give you some strategies or they actually have even for visually impaired, they have skiing programs with uh, a guide who will ski with you. Um, below that is a tandem recumbent bike. Um, so being able to cycle is another fun activity. Um, you have an extra person with you to help if you want an extra person. You could get just a tandem bike, which is low and easier to balance. You can get bikes that have hand controls, three wheels, four wheels. You can, there's all kinds of adapted bikes out there. So getting creative and just looking into what you need um, and what works best for you. Another thing to think about with that though is, you know, reaching out to a PT or an OT for some of these adaptive equipment before you purchase them might help you be able to make sure you're spending your money on the right thing and you don't get the wrong modifications and kind of waste a little bit of money. So um, if you're looking into something like that, I do recommend reaching out to a therapist who can help you make sure you're picking the right thing before you make a big purchase. If, and if you're oh, close to a metropolitan area that has a rehab hospital, Mm -hmm. um, those rehab hospitals often have adaptive sports programs and you may not know about them unless you've been to say physical therapy or OP at that hospital. Um, so I'd encourage you to look at what's close by you because they are starting to, um, to get back together live again. And many of these these sports programs you can find through those rehab hospitals. Um, also, particularly with biking, um, if you live in a city that has a bike MS through the National MS Society, uh, very often you can meet people who are tandem riding um, or using bikes that have um, a motor uh, to help to help propel, take some of the energy off. So just some some ways to get involved with these types yep. of sports. Yeah, and I think often those are called um, power assist bikes. Yeah. So if you're Googling it or looking for something um, in that area, power assist bicycle, they also make those little motors you can attach to wheelchairs and they're called a power assist wheelchair as well. Um, so if you know fatigue in a wheelchair is, is an issue for you navigating a boardwalk or something like that, power assist is a great tool to look into. Um, and they are really fancy these days, Bluetooth with watches and all kinds of crazy stuff. And they might start flying to Mars soon. Um, <laughs> and the last picture I have here is of um, adapted bo um, bocce ball. 
So there's a ramp and they set the bocce ball on there. And the technical rule is that the person playing has to be the last one to touch it. So somebody can help hold it and they can touch it in any way whatsoever. It can be an elbow. It can be a finger. Some people will use a, um, a stick with their mouth and push it with their mouth. But that ramp is set up exactly how the participant wants it to be. So they might say, turn it a little more this way or a little more that way. So they're deciding where to turn that little ramp, how steep to make it or shallow to make it. And then someone might set the ball on for them and then roll it down for them. You can see only one of them has the ramp. Um, several other people actually just kind of throw the bocce ball from the side of the wheelchair. Some people just choose to bring a chair and sit to do it just to conserve some energy. Um, so it's just another leisure activity that can be fun and it's nice to get around other people. Um, and there's some pictures I didn't have on that one. And if we can go back one real quick, Krista, um, there's also basketball, uh, wheelchair basketball is, is an option. Um, and they also have uh, seated pickleball or wheelchair pickleball as well as another one. Um, so if there's a sport that you love, think of the sport and and see what's out there you know there's tons of sports i'm sure i'm leaving off but um just see what's out there look for it and and it might be already made and if it's not maybe you're going to be the one to figure it out and make it awesome for everybody else all right now we can go to the next one and um this is my last slide of pictures so <laughs> um these are our outdoor activities so this is more the colorado i'm over here with this one i think more um so there is adaptive hiking. Um, we actually have a group out here in Colorado, if any of you are, are in the Colorado area, um, called the Lockwood Foundation that actually takes, um, you can see in, on the top left here, there's a adapted chair um, and it's made so that people can carry that chair and it can kind of roll a little bit, but they take people to climb like 14ers, like they're climbing huge mountains and people are using those chairs and there's six people helping carry that person up the mountain. So. Um, that's a fun, you know, just adventure. Like some people may never think they'd get on top of a mountain that's 14,000 feet high, but that could be an option. Um, there's also, is it uh, Stanton Park has an action track chairs. I should have put a picture, I didn't think of it. Um, and it's like a tank, basically. It's a weird wheelchair slash tank and you drive it with, uh, I think it's a joystick and it goes over rocks and bumps and stuff like that and you can ride this through the trails in the woods and it's free it's a state park thing it's free to rent you just have to reserve it online ahead of time um adapted fishing so I mean, simply sitting while you're fishing is a great way to just conserve some energy um there's also modified fishing poles there's different options for hand controls and arm controls and supports um, there are, are neck, kind of like a necklace thing that hangs down and it has a little scoop at the bottom. I don't know if you can see me. And the um, fishing pole can rest in that to give a little bit of extra support. Um, so adaptive fishing is good. Again, finding groups in your area, like Megan said, different groups of people. We have a group out here called Outdoor Buddies, um, which is actually, I think both of the two middle pictures are from them. Um, that takes people on outdoor activities. People who have different abilities get to go and do these activities with people there to support them with adaptive equipment provided um, and education. You know, they, they know a lot about what has worked, what hasn't worked, what, where to find the resources. Um, so the next one is actually a couple out hunting, um, you know, and that's something that a lot of people, if you're physically limited with mobility, might assume that you can't hunt. Um, but actually, they modify chairs. Um, they modify the guns to be able to hunt. Um, they are able to help position things for you. Um, some, actually, most states have an option for, uh, I think it's usually called the disabled hunter. And um, you're allowed to hunt from a car or a truck instead if you're not physically able to get through the woods. Um, so another thing just to kind of look into what adaptations are out there if that's that's your thing. And the last one is a picture of a girl on an adapted saddle for horseback riding. So it has trunk support um, behind her. It also has support for both of her arms to rest to support her trunk a little extra. Um, so another activity, way to get outside, hit up some of those trails if you're out in the mountains and enjoy mother nature a little bit. <laughs> So while you're thinking about doing these things, um, 
it's important to know that there is special pricing available uh, for people with uh, disabilities. Um, tickets and access, uh, all of these things are things that you really should know about because no one's going to offer them to you <laughs> unless you ask. Um, which most of us know about the secret things in life, right? So um, the National Park Service actually has a $10 lifetime pass if you have any percent of permanent disability from the Social Security Disability Administration, I'm assuming. Um, so a $10 lifetime pass to any national park. It's really, um, I mean, I, it usually costs, well, depending on the park, sometimes $20 to get into any park, if not yeah. more. So yeah. that's that's really a great deal. I don't know if this is per car or per person, <laughs> but in any case, you're probably it's saving. actually per car. It per is per car. car. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge savings yeah, for the, for the whole is. family. Um, most state parks also offer a discount if you don't want a lifetime pass. Um, and the state park, so in Florida, um, we have state beaches that you actually, sometimes you can drive, at certain beaches you can drive on the beach. Um, so these also qualify as state parks. So be sure to ask for a discount if you're um, at a state park or driving on a beach. Um, discount recreational center pricing is often available if you're going to, um, say, a place to do the adaptive ice hockey or adaptive skate, um, adaptive ski, something like that. Um, discount hunting licenses are offered in many states. Um, and then many states allow modified, like Stephanie said, modified hunting from your vehicle um, if you're physically uh, limited from navigating terrain. So I think it's just important to know that you have the right um, to ask for a special circumstance given what you're dealing with. And I, I would also throw in there that um, you know, one of the most common things that we hear in MS is, but you look so good, right? So I would actually argue that if you are a person who looks so great with MS, but you have really li rate limiting fatigue, that you need to give yourself permission to ask for the same discount as someone who has a more visible mobility problem. Absolutely. And you know, what I think is, is nice and kind of like you can appreciate about this part here is that having any disability is expensive. It is not cheap. Medical, the medical world is expensive, ridiculously expensive. So appreciating the fact that these discounts are being provided to make that a little easier for you. Um, because, you know, people understand that, you know, that wheelchair was not cheap. Even if insurance paid for it, you might have to pay for parts to it or something like that. Or, um, you know, your crutches or your canes weren't cheap. So these discounts are there to help offset that that expense in life. And, you know, also um, I wanted to point out that rec centers, and I know by me it's in often called the Silver C Silver Sneaker Program. Is it the same by you, Megan? Um, sometimes if you ask them about their Silver Sneaker Program, they can, um, that's usually what the discount I think is through um, with a disability. And that applies to gyms, uh, YMCA's, mm -hmm. a lot of YMCA's have silver sneakers programs, but so mm -hmm. do a lot of like Planet Fitness, LA Fitness, um, some of these uh, more chain gyms um, mm -hmm. have those uh, special pricings available too. And if you have Medicare, uh, many Medicare uh, programs will pay for the silver sneakers program. So it's actually free to you, like yep. completely. And even um, if you have other health insurances, a lot of them offer a discount for those um, rec centers and things. Like I know I pay $30 a month through my health insurance um, agreement they have with a company. And that company gives me access to like a couple thousand gyms. So I literally have membership to like five gyms because I do home health therapy and I'm all over the place. So I have a gym in every town that I work in that I can go to. Um, so look through your insurance to see what opportunities you can get through them at a discount as well. That's a great idea. So here's some tips for finding resources because this, um, this stuff is is not intuitive. It, it just isn't. And, you know, not many of us walk around thinking, oh, everyone's going to give us a deal. But that's really what we should be thinking. So here's, 
it is. So here are some good resources for you guys. When you're searching online, look for terms like adapted activity. So maybe adapted travel or adapted yoga or adapted basketball or modified. Um, those are the really the politically correct terms that are going to get you to the resources that you want. Um, also reach out to your community. So use Facebook, use Nextdoor, which is more like um, really directly applicable literally to your neighborhood a lot of the time. Uh, 4-H, Rotary Clubs, Shriners, um, MS support groups, other local volunteer groups. And if you feel like you're isolated and you're not quite sure um, who to reach out to, reach out to an MS navigator at the National MS Society and they will connect you to your local resources for these things. Um, you can inquire through groups who already engage in these activities like cycling groups, hiking groups, um, road teams, horseback riding, etc. And I do just want to um, I just do just want to throw in something about horseback riding hippotherapy, which is what horseback riding therapy is called, has been really well studied in MS um, and, and has shown great outcomes for um, improving uh, multiple physical measures of MS. And then there's also a new, uh, a really a revival of equestrian therapy and actually using horses for mental health therapy. So there's two different things. There's riding, you know, riding the horse and, you know, getting the, the physical benefit of how the horse moves your body. But then there's also just being with the animal itself that can be highly beneficial. So if you're in an area where there is a lot of equestrian activity, I would encourage you to look for both of those things. So um, more resources, um, asking scout groups, uh, Boy Scout groups, Girl Scout groups, um, college engineering programs, um, OT and PT programs to help build or fabricate adapted tools and equipment. Um, again, reaching out to your MS support groups. So many of the people who I've known forever in my area um, have family members who have really like built these incredible wheelchairs for, for being outdoors beyond anything I've ever seen on the internet, um, just by using their imagination and knowing what, what the person's interests were. Reach out to people like that. Um, ask your occupational or physical therapist, your neurologist, counselor, nurse practitioner, social worker, anyone else on your team if they have resources. Um, and, you know, really using these resources in a different way. So you might have a referral to physical therapy um, and that referral might be to help you with reconditioning because in the past year you haven't done much physical activity and you need some help. I would encourage you to tell your physical therapist that your goal is to participate in X, Y, or Z activity. Um, and, and that activity would be like an adaptive activity. And I guarantee you, you've made that physical therapist day A. Uh-huh, you sure have. <laughs> or occupational therapist day. Yep. And that they will help you create a program that gets you towards that goal. So not just like, oh, I want to get stronger with my left leg, but oh, I want to get stronger with both my legs and conserve energy so that I can ride X number of miles on my cool adaptive cycle. So really share those things with your therapists when you are um, working towards those goals to make them as meaningful as possible for you and to take you out of the algorithm of what many people think physical therapy is. And as I know many therapists, what they're sick of too, they really want to help you <laughs> meet yeah. your your dream goals. Um, you can also check out the website challengeathletes.org for equipment grants. Um, and I would also encourage you to look at msfocus.org. There are some adaptive um, equipment grants available there as well. And that might be just another thing to think of is when you're looking for equipment, just putting in 
adapted equipment grants and searching. There are probably a million other ones out there that we can't know them all. And, you know, you might have more than one um, diagnosis, right? You might have comorbidities. Maybe you have diabetes. Well, maybe you can get adaptive equipment through the diabetes group. Or maybe you have visual impairments because of MS. Well, now there's uh, groups for visually impaired and blind. So think outside the box when you're looking for those resources, when you're trying to find um, those grants or financial assistance for those things. So I'm a traveler. Um, my most exciting moment was last week when I traveled without my four-year-old. <laughs> Um, but but because of my four-year-old, I have learned to plan ahead for smooth sailing. So I'll go ahead and offer you these trips for planning for travel. Um, first of all, a few months ahead of time, do you have the mobility equipment that you need? And you may say you may you know have and during a normal day you have everything you need. But let's think about what you're going to do while you're traveling. Are you going to be walking more, having less access to rest? Um, do you need to see an occupational therapist or a physical therapist and perhaps consider an additional piece of adaptive equipment so you can enjoy yourself more and have less fatigue? A few weeks ahead of time, make sure you have enough medication for your trip. Talk to your pharmacy about travel refills. Make a medication list that includes your medical history, your provider's contact information, emergency contact information, um, call your airline, call your train station, your cruise line, and your bus station, you know, whatever form of transportation you're using, and talk to them about your mobility needs are, what your mobility needs are, and what they can offer you. Um, a few days ahead of time, make a packing list, and make this as detailed as possible so that you can uh, eliminate any worry that you may have. If you're going to a remote place, it's more important that you forgot something. If you're going to a place of a major metropolitan area, it doesn't matter if you forgot a t-shirt because you can buy one, right? Um, but it's important that you have everything you need. Make snack packs to travel with of non-perishable healthy foods, include a refillable water bottle. Most um, airports now have um, the, I forget the brand, but the, you know, they either have water fountains or just the filtered water that you can put your water bottle under. And guess what? It saves you about $6, <laughs> if not more, depending on the brand yeah. of bottled water you're, you're taking. And then make sure that you take your medications on your in your carry-on with you so that there's no potential for getting lost. And Megan, one of the things I really like to use, it, and I just used it this past weekend, we went camping. I have an app called Out of Milk. Um, and it's your, my grocery shopping list, but it all like I just make one of my lists for my trip. Um, so I have a camping list on there. And the nice thing is if I'm out at the grocery store and I think, oh, I got to remember to pack the matches so we can light a fire when we're camping. I can just add it on there. And the really cool part is um, after I've used it and checked everything off, I can actually refresh it and bring them all back and not have to make that list again. So it's really nice to be able to just make one list and refresh it and bring it nice. back. And it just saves energy. And you know how much I like to save energy. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, so speaking of saving energy, um, how to keep on keeping on. So the biggest thing I hear is fatigue. Fatigue limits my ability to engage in things. I get too tired. I don't have the energy. Um, so someone told me once that MS gives you a dollar a day. Um, and that's the energy you get. You get one dollar worth of energy to spend and you're going to decide how to spread that dollar out. You might spend 50 cents just in the morning and then you have 50 cents for the rest of the day and it's not enough. Um, so learning how to budget that dollar is really powerful. So um, conserving maybe energy in the morning instead of standing in the shower, would you consider sitting in the shower to save a little bit of energy so that you just save five cents and later today you might be able to go on that walk that you really wanted to go on or, or take your dog to the dog park or something like that. Um, so we like to use the fatigue scale. So um, one to 10, how fatigued are you? And when you start getting at that six and seven, you're really pushing those limits. Um, your balance might not be as good. It might be harder to think. 
your hands might not function like they used to, your vision might get blurry, you might be a little more emotional or reactive um, and sensitive. So if you can identify when your fatigue is getting too high or too worked up, um, give yourself a break, rest a little bit and conserve some of that energy. Because if you can get yourself back down to a five, you might be able to do those things better and they become less expensive um, where walking the dog at a seven might cost 50 cents. Walking the dog at a three might cost 10 cents. So budgeting that and pacing that energy is really important. We do talk a lot about the four P's in some of our programs, um, planning ahead, planning what your day is going to be, look at it and, and determine what's going to be the best time to do it. Do you mow the lawn at two o'clock in the afternoon when it's a million degrees outside? Maybe not. Um, do you plan to mow at seven at night when the sun has started to set and it's cooler? Might be a better idea. Pacing, trying not to do all of the heavy work early in the day. So then you're pooped and then the rest of your day is a wash and maybe even the next day because you stole a dollar from the day ahead of you. Um, prioritizing, so what really needs to be done? Can you wait to mow the lawn tomorrow when the temperature is cooler? And then positioning. So when you're doing things, like I said, if you're taking a shower and you can sit to take a shower, that's going to save you a little energy. I catch myself cheating little things all the time. When I blow dry my hair, my arm gets tired. So I have this like towel rack that I put my arm on and I blow dry my hair like that all the time. And I didn't even notice I did it until one day I was like, oh, I'm totally saving a penny. Okay. <laughs> um, so those little positioning things, how can you save a penny by positioning yourself? Um, Consider adaptive equipment. So a lot of people don't like adaptive equipment because it means I'm disabled or I look different or I'm giving in. Um, and at some point, it's interesting when you think of it in a different way of, I sat in that shower chair this morning and now I got to go to the dog park. So really who won when you gave in? It, it wasn't really a give in, it was a, I modified, right? Um, if you went to a building and they were installing a ramp, for somebody using a wheelchair, you're not going to look at it and go, oh, they're giving in, they should get that wheelchair up the stairs. No, they're modifying how you can get to things. So I think that's a really big challenge for a lot of people is being open to things looking a little different. Maybe those things are on your list of I never want to do X, Y, Z. Um, but if you never want to try that thing, you might never get the opportunity to go cycling or kayaking or hike a mountain. So it's just important to think about it. Um, staying hydrated and eating well while you're vacating. Um, I think a lot of times we go on vacation and a cruise and there's a lot of drinking or heavy eating or a lot of caffeine. So keeping those things in mind when you're vacating because our bodies don't like a huge change in our diet. <laughs> um, and being dehydrated will also make it harder to manage um, temperatures. Bowel and bladder function, which I think Megan's going to talk a little bit more about, but um, keeping in mind that alcohol and caffeine can impact the bowel and bladder function. Staying hydrated is important so that your bladder works and functions better for you. Um, getting good sleep. So staying up until two in the morning and waking up at six in the morning might not be ideal for your fatigue management. Um, so keeping in mind that you do still need to sleep when you're on vacation and not sleeping and staying up that extra two hours might mean the next day is kind of a wash. So keep that in mind. And if you need to take breaks and naps, schedule them, put them in your planner, put them in your phone or reminders and just say, you know, usually around 11 o'clock, I get pretty tired. I'm going to go hang out in the, uh, the cabin at that time on my cruise and go take a quick nap. And don't skip medications. Um, take your daily pills. Don't skip your medications. It might affect you negatively, and then you can't enjoy your trip as much. If you need to, because you're out of routine, routines change when we're on vacation, use alarms to help you remember those medications um, and, and reminders on your phone, or ask your uh, support partner or the person with you if they can help you remember as well. Good hints. All right, Megan. Yeah, so I'll I'll swing us home here, um, and I'll I have to say, Stephanie, that like some of the the most common reasons that I have emergency follow ups in my office are coming off of a change in routine where medications were missed, diets changed, um, you know that sort of thing. So really, really important. A great way that you can help to manage your bowel function is to play spot the potty before you need it. So no matter where you're going, um, chances are you can find a map of that place. 
make sure you know where the closest bathrooms are. If it's a place where you've gone, map out um, how you might get there. Um, if you're traveling by car, plan to stop regularly for bathroom breaks. And you can make it fun. You know, you can choose fun rest stops instead of just, uh, you know, your, your average uh, truck yeah. stop. Um, and really be mindful of the impact of alcohol on bowel, bowel and bladder function. It can do uh, just about anything to either function and none of it's fun when you don't expect it. <laughs> and balance on top of yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Make sure that you handle the heat well. Um, and just because you're not in a hot area, uh, doesn't mean you don't need to consider cooling equipment. We've got some great uh, resources here listed for ways to stay cool. Um, and you need to think about any kind of movement increasing your core temperature. So it's not just about ambient temperature. It's 95 degrees outside. It's about you moving your body and increasing your core temperature. And all of these things that are listed here can actually improve your energy level. And there's also going to be a webinar June 17th where we're going to talk about um, staying active and staying cool. So if you have a chance to join us, then that would be great. Um, and we can chat more about those strategies. Yeah. And, and some of those include also leisure on the lighter side. So maybe you're just enjoying um, the environment, but you're outside reading or you're doing puzzles or playing games or having a movie night. Um, you know, enjoying uh, the area and the company, but not necessarily doing a physically a, a physically active activity. So if there's a will, there's a way. So enjoy what you can. Be open to those adaptations and those modifications. Plan ahead. Reach out to your community and research what is available. If it isn't, make it available. Create it. Reach out and find someone to help you to do it. And the biggest thing is just have fun, enjoy it. So I think we're going to open up to some question answers. And I'm, I feel like we pushed so far into our time. We get to talk. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. We did. Yeah, we do have some time for a few uh, questions now. Um, I did just want to say as a reminder to everyone who joined us tonight, uh, we will ask you to complete a survey at the end of the webinar. Um, a box will pop up at the very end. So just keep your eye out for that. Uh, but like I said, first, let's get to a couple of questions. Um, so one of the questions that was submitted, um, what tips do you have about accessibility and assistance in airports and flights? Yeah, so the first tip um, I would advise is for the person to call the airline that they are flying. Um, and the airline very often will either provide you with a service or direct you to how they will give you the service. So either um, someone who meets you with a wheelchair and takes you to your gate and helps you get on the plane or the cart that goes back and forth. Um, but usually the airlines will help you um, navigate that. Um, oftentimes airports also have uh, almost like a con concierge isn't the right word, but they have like an airport coordinator um, who can help you identify uh, resources for uh, accessible um, uh, accessible areas of the airport. And you can also often um, go through a different part of TSA. You might not have mm -hmm. to go through the same TSA as everyone else, um, which can be very helpful. And, and you might skip that line and save a little bit of energy. Um, and you don't have to tell them what your disability is. You can be completely secret if you want. That's helpful info. Um, now question, we're all excited to get back in the pools. Um, are indoor and outdoor pools still safe? Are we feeling <laughs> safe about those right now? We got two thumbs up from Megan. Yeah, so yeah. Two CD's, thumbs up from Stephanie, I love it. <laughs> if anybody's been in an indoor pool or even a community outdoor pool, um, I think that by just the smell of the chemicals, <laughs> <laughs> we know they're fairly safe, and if a little one has an accident in the pool, they close them for several several hours. <laughs> so yes, the pools are safe, um, and that that's also uh, documented on the CDC website. Okay, great. 
Um, now, you know, the theme for this month is staying active. So what suggestions do you have uh, for one individual who wants to increase her ability to walk longer distances with friends? Um, are there any exercises, therapies um, to build strength and stamina so she can continue to do longer walks with friends? So the first thing I would say is getting a consultation with a PT. Um, physical therapy is going to actually be able to analyze specifically what your needs are. I've not seen your body, um, so I can't say exactly what someone's need is. Um, I think the big thing is to, if you're already mobile and you're already walking, um, walking within your limits and not pushing beyond those limits. We had a woman one time who was like, oh, I just keep going. And she's like, I'm walking all the way bent over. My nose is to the floor, but I keep going. But but really, you're, you're training your body to learn to walk like that then. So if you're noticing your form is changing, you're not walking the same, you're limping or something like that, you wanna be very careful that you don't continue doing that because that's a way to retrain your body to do it the wrong way. Um, so really pacing yourself, I think is, is a huge thing. I don't think I could give a specific exercise because that's something a PT would really have to be able to look at for you um, and, and find out what your need is. The other thing I would share is that um, there are there's one medication that's approved oh, yeah. in certain people uh, to improve walking speed. So that's something that um, you can address with your MS care provider, your you know neurologist, NP or PA, um, and also cooling equipment. Yeah. Absolutely. Staying cool and really getting your, your friends that are with you to understand your needs. I think a big thing is communicating with them uh, what your needs are, what your limits might be, what your goals are, and how they can help you, too. Yeah. So let's one more question, then we'll wrap up for uh, the evening. But I want to revisit the bowel and bladder issues because, I you know, those are so frequent for people living with MS and um, I think there's something that we don't always talk about. So I definitely want to bring that one back up. Um, wondering if you have any tips for washroom or restroom frequency, mobility and speed to getting to the restroom. Any ideas to add to my toolbox? I love that. I love yeah. it too. <laughs> Gosh, those are great questions. So the first thing that I would say is, and again, counter counterintuitive, but stay well hydrated. Um, if you are not well hydrated, your bladder actually gets more irritable and you have you're going to have more urgency. Um, stay well hydrated. Um, make sure that you know where restrooms are um, and consider wearing um, if you're a female, consider wearing um, maybe a light panty liner or if you're a man or a woman, maybe you wear um, a light depend type undergarment just in case. Um, you don't get to the bathroom in time and put those in your to go bag, put those in your travel bag um, so that you don't have to worry about, well, what if I have one and then I need another one? Um, this goes back to another reason about why it's so important to manage your diet while you're traveling, um, because if you're not, if you've totally radically changed your diet while you're traveling um, and your your bowel schedule gets off, then you're really setting yourself up for failure. So if you're used to following a healthy diet, try to follow that while you're traveling. Get in the greens, get in the fiber, get in the things that you need um, so that you can, can continue on your regular bowel schedule and maybe practice time voiding. So, yeah. you know, yeah, every one to two hours, I'm going to need to stop and look for a bathroom so I don't have an accident. And that's totally yeah. fine. And sometimes those messages just come when it's there's not enough time left. So going before that message is coming in can really help if you're using that time voiding. If bowel and bladder is a huge issue for you, also think about talking to a urologist and yes. finding out, is there a medication that works for you? Are you appropriate for self-cathing? Some people don't empty. Um, or do you need to see a pelvic floor therapist who can work on the muscles? So, you know, not only adapting what you do or modifying your life, but also can you fix it a little? Can you improve it with exercise or medications or, or 
strategies. So and people use those medications or those strategies only when their routines change or only when they're traveling. So just because you have to talk to someone about that and maybe consider using it doesn't mean it's going to become part of your everyday routine. Yeah. Yep. And I knew some people who just cast before flying because they knew a long flight was coming. Yeah, that's some great information. Thank you, uh, both of you, for sharing all of your knowledge with us tonight. I really appreciate you both being here. Um, this webinar may be over, but we want to make sure that everyone um, who's tuning in tonight stays connected with us. You can follow us on social media for the latest programs, resources, and MS news. Um, you can also register for our monthly e-news series by visiting our website. Uh, the mission of the National MS Society is to help people affected by MS live their best lives as they stop MS in its tracks, restore what has been lost, and end MS forever. You can explore other society programs, services, and resources um, on their website, nationalmssociety.org. And lastly, I do want to address, uh, we had a handful of questions about fatigue in the question chat box tonight. Next month will be super important for you to tune in if you were one of those folks um, who challenges, who has challenges with fatigue. We're going to focus on fatigue and other invisible symptoms. That'll be on a webinar Wednesday again, July 7th. So we hope to see all of you uh, at that program as well. Um, so thank you all for tuning in tonight. Thank you again to Megan and Stephanie, and also thank you to our sponsors.